on a fear that every boy, girl, man, woman has. Now, we all have fears. We fear spiders. We fear snakes, particularly the venomous ones. We, some of us fear heights. I've never heard of anybody fearing being short, but that's another thing. <laughs> but every man, boy, girl, and woman has a fear of death and the grave. If you want to stop a conversation real quick, start talking about death. Start talking about the grave. But I want to tell you that Christ is our victory. And that was the answer that Paul gave to the Corinthian church when they were afraid of the afterlife. They were afraid of death. And they were afraid of the grave. Go with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 51 through 58. Now I'll go back up a little bit into chapter 15 to set the context. But here are the words of Paul. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, from the, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible has, should, shall put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass that saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Paul is writing to the Corinthian church to correct some problems that they had, as well as to answer some questions they had posed. You see, the Corinthian church was braggadocious. They thought and bragged about it, that they were the church of all power, wisdom, knowledge. And yet, in this church, Paul writes because there was divisions among them. And then Paul also writes because the rich were mistreating the poor. And one of the major things I think he writes about is that they had started an agape feast to go along with the Holy Communion. But the problem was, some of them, when they brought their food, wasn't sharing it with the poor. And others of them were getting drunk. And Paul writes and warns them of such behavior. But then they had a legitimate question. What is the plight of the dead? Now, we have a lot of revelation now. But remember, this is the beginning of the church. And you got Jews and Gentiles coming together. You have your Jewish traditions and you have your Gentile traditions of what afterlife is all about and what happens to the dead. Paul begins it very elementary because he talks about everything's given a body. 
And it brings them up to the place where they need to be. Because he says, a piece of corn is given a body. But when you plant it, and it comes up, it's a different body. A piece of grain has a body. But when you plant it, it comes up, it has a different body. The celestial have different bodies. The terrestrial have different bodies. And God made a body for them. And God has made a natural body for us. But He also is preparing us a spiritual body. And Paul brings them to this place to talk about this. Notice what he says. He says that the resurrection of dead is sown in corruption. It's the flesh is put down. But it's raised in incorruption. It is sown a natural body. It's raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It's raised a spiritual body. Paul promises that we have borne the image of the earthy. And that's what this is. But we shall also bear the image of the heavenly. And what he means by that, we're going to have a body just like our precious Lord. Amen. No different. No better, but just the same. Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. God has prepared a glorified body for us to live in the kingdom. Amen. When we die, Paul said, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. But we don't take our bodies with us. Our spirit and our soul go back to God to whom it belongs awaiting the resurrection or the rapture if you're still alive. And on that great resurrection day, all spirits and souls will get that glorified body. And so when we begin to understand this, we begin to understand that in the resurrection we shall be changed and we receive our glorified body. Both those in the grave are going to be changed because remember, they're returning to dust. But we who are alive and remain walking in this flesh and blood for a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, we experience death. For it's given unto man once to die and then the judgment. Just for that blink of an eye. But then we're changed. And we receive our glorified body. And we rise to be with Jesus in the air. And we don't need a space suit. And we don't need rockets that can't get off on time. Amen. Because I guarantee you, when that trumpet blows, we're gone. We're gone. Amen. Won't be any time to pack your bags. Won't be any time to buy your ticket. You'll be ready at that time for Sion, your left behind. That's why we stay in this blessed book. And we read it. And we digest it. And we take it as part of us and put it into our spirit so that we can be changed from the earthly to the heavenly, from faith to faith, and from glory to glory. It's this blessed book that brings us to the place that we can be like Jesus. Amen. Amen. The greatest goal of any child of God should to be like Jesus. Amen. Transform me, Lord. Let my heart be the heart of Jesus. Let the things I see be the things that Jesus sees. Let the things I hear be the things that Jesus hears. And let my hands be the hands that are used 
by Jesus. And let my feet be the feet that Jesus guides to preach this glorious gospel, to bear witness that Jesus is alive forevermore. Amen. Amen. Paul reveals the mystery of this resurrection. And in revealing it, he reveals an aspect that neither the Jews nor the Gentiles have ever heard of. It's called the rapture. You see, in the Jews there was split thinking. The Sadducees believed in neither angels or the resurrection. Pharisees like Paul believed in both angels and the resurrection. Isn't it interesting how God chose Paul, a Pharisee, to reveal the mystery of the resurrection and the rapture? Why? Because he had always had a grain. The Gentiles, on the other hand, they believed in Valhalla. If you died in battle, or died a good person, you would go to some heavenly place. The wicked in all of these things went to Hades. That's one agreement that the Gentiles and the Jews believed. That if you were wicked, you were going to a bad place. And so now he has a church, a baby church, that has concern. Some of them were being baptized for the dead. <clears throat> because they wanted to make sure they got to heaven. And there are a group that calls himself Christian, that still are baptized for the dead. Friends, I want to tell you, after someone passes on, and this breath of life is gone, there's not anything you can do. Right. Destiny is final. Amen. It's what we do on this side of the grave that determines our eternal destiny. Amen? Amen? And I want to tell you, if we're really working on that, then every day we're coming to that place where we can live that abundant life. Mm -hmm. That life that has joy. Yes. That life that has peace. Amen. That life that has comfort. <laughs> and even when the winds blow against you and toss you to and fro, you know that you're anchored in the rock. <laughs> Amen. Yeah. You know that any minute that he can rise up into your place and say, Peace, be still. That's right. And there is a call. Mm -hmm. Isn't it a joy being a Christian? Amen. Amen. Isn't it a joy being a child of God? Amen. Amen. Isn't it a joy knowing you are serving the Almighty God? Yes. Amen. Who has all the resources of heaven and earth mm -hmm. at his fingertips. And is ready to give it to you mm -hmm. through grace and mercy. Mm -hmm. We are the most blessed people on the face of the earth. Amen. 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 We're the only true religion mm -hmm. on the face of the earth. And I know that's more than a religion because we have a relationship. Mm -hmm. You see, you can go and see all those other religions. And they have no relationship with the God they're praying to. Mm -hmm. They're going through all kinds of antics. Mm -hmm. Hoping their God will listen. Hoping their God will do something. Sacrifices and all kinds of things. Mm -hmm. Trying to appease their God. I want to tell you. When God our Father sacrificed the Son of God. On the cross of Calvary. He made the only sacrifice that we will ever need. That's Amen. Right. That's right. And all He says offer to me the fruit of your lips sacrifices of praise unto your God. Amen. If we can go up to Mama and Daddy 
and grandma and grandpa and say thank you for the present. Thank you for touching me and meeting my needs. We ought to be able to go up to God and say, God, thank you. Yes. Thank you for today. I woke up in a new day and a new challenge. And I'm only up because you allowed me to wake up. And I was only able to get out of my bed because you gave me the strength to get out of my bed. And I was only able to clothe myself because you gave me the strength to clothe myself. And I know I have a purpose because you gave it to me. So this day, I'll be trying to fulfill that purpose. Amen? So when we look at this, He comes to us and tells us that Jesus is the first fruits of the resurrection. Which means to say, and the first fruits was those part of the harvest that you brought, the Jews did, to offer sacrifice to God. As an example of what they hoped the entire crop would be. Here's the interesting thing. God taught the Jews to tithe before they ever got anything. A faith time. And so they would take how much of their harvest, first harvest, first fruit, and they'd offer that believing that God would see their faith and see their love for Him and that He would bless the harvest. And it's called the first fruits of the harvest. Well, when Jesus is the first fruits of the resurrection, then what He is, we shall be. Amen. That same Holy Ghost, that same Spirit of God, that quickened Jesus' body shall also quicken our immortal bodies. Amen. There's going to come a shaking in this world one of these days. People will be going by cemeteries and there's going to be some rocking and some rolling as the Holy Ghost begins to get those bones together. And the trumpet sounds and those bodies begin to hear and they come up out of that grave. <laughs> Amen. And God gives them a glorified body. And we hear, whoa, just that quick. We didn't know, but boom, we're gone. <laughs> you see, unbelievers believe that too. Have you ever noticed on the news how they use our words? Armageddon. I was told and read several years ago that the New York Times already has a news item written. And it says this. Millions have disappeared. Some say it's the rapture. <laughs> Even the idiots know the truth. Amen. God will let this world know who He is and that He will be served. And every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Amen. Amen. And I'd rather bow my knee every Sunday and call Him Lord than not bow my knee and be forced to call Him. Because our calling and election is sure. We have been sealed by the sweet Holy Ghost of God. Amen. That's why you can walk around freely. I'm not afraid of some booger jumping out of the dark and hurting me. <laughs> if he kills me, go on to glory. Well, he's the loser. Mm -hmm. Amen. I'm not afraid of getting out there and driving on that road thinking some nuts going on into me. Never crosses my mind. For one thing I know, if it's not my time, ain't nothing going to happen. Right. Another thing I know is God has put His angels around me to take care of me. Amen? Just like He has for you. Paul says, it is blessed to be part of the first resurrection 
For this is the resurrection of the righteous dead. The first resurrection is a resurrection into eternal life and rewards. But woe into that man or woman that participates in the second resurrection because the second resurrection is a resurrection of death where the wicked is raised up to stand before God for judgment and eternal damnation. Thank God. We will be part of the first resurrection. Paul tells the Christians in Corinth, we shall not all sleep. He says God's coming back. He was expecting it. <coughs> but we shall all be changed. Why? Because this whole body can't stand before God. It can't take it. Can you imagine? We can't even take the sunshine because it will burn us to the bone. And God's glory is ten times times ten thousand greater than the sun. And when we stand in His countenance, He says, I'm going to have Him have a body that can stand in my presence. Amen. It'll be a body like Jesus' body. If we need to, we'll go through that wall and it won't stop us. Amen. Amen. If we need to be in Atlanta, Georgia, boom, we're there. Because there is nothing that will hinder us. Gravity will have no effect on us. Better in a spaceship. Amen. God, uh, Paul tells us that the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and the believers that are alive will all be changed. Now notice. Paul then changes the narrative and he declares our victory over death and the grave. Paul tells us that our flesh and blood, the corruptible, must put on incorruption or the glorified body. And this mortal which is subject to death must put on immortality or an eternal body. An eternal body that Satan can't touch. An eternal body that death cannot touch. An eternal body that sickness nor disease cannot touch. Amen? No more diabetes. No more blood pressure. Amen? No more cancer. No more other infirmities that this world now experiences. For they can't touch us. It is only in this manner that death shall be defeated and the believer will experience victory. You notice how you fear death, how you conquer that? You know who you are in Christ Jesus. You know where you're going in Christ Jesus. And you know that death is just the gateway to heaven. Amen? And here's the really good part about it. You're not going to stay in that grave forever. Because when the trump sounds, if you're dead, you're going to come up. And if you're walking, you're going to go up. <laughs> Amen? And Sharon, on TV this morning, a woman who was talking about her mom who had died. And while she was talking, tears came in her eyes. She knew her mother had gone to heaven. And so this mother let this little boy go up to that woman afterwards because he was concerned. That lady was talking about heaven. And she was crying. So he went and asked a question. He says, ma'am, you were doing all right. But then you got talked about your mama and about heaven. And you got to crying. Why? You know how little kids are. They're just simple and want to know everything. Sometimes when there's not an answer. And so the woman said to him, 
Well, yes. When I got to thinking about my mom, brought tears to my eyes. And even though she's in heaven, I still had tears in my eyes. And so she says to the little boy, don't you want to go to heaven? And the little boy said, no, ma'am, not today. No, ma'am, not today. He thought she was getting up a load to go to heaven and he didn't want to be part of it. But you do. Some people do that, not as a child, but as an adult. Do you want Jesus as your personal Savior today? Because He can forgive you your sins today. You can have eternal life today. And if God calls you to heaven, you'll go to heaven today. And some will respond, not now. How sad it is. Because it's coming a day when some people have put it off so long, there are no more chances. Amen. What we do when God calls and when God moves upon our hearts, we have to act immediately. Because we don't know about tomorrow. Death will be swallowed up in victory. As a result, the fear of death and the grave is defeated, and we can say, O oh, death, where is thy sting? O oh, grave, where is thy sting? Paul summarizes by saying our victory is through our Lord Jesus Christ. I remember a precious saint of God, Sister Ann Griffiths. Her and her husband Tom had been married for decades. And Tom died. I remember seeing her on the front seat of the church. She was crying, yes. She was grieving. But in her tears, she was saying, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. And she was saying loud enough that I could hear. I knew where she was coming from. And when we got to the grave, I'll never forget. And their Lord her husband in the grave. She said, Thank you, Lord. Tom's not hurting anymore. He's not hurting anymore. And Lord, I know this is not Tom that I'm laying to rest here. Tom is already in your presence. Thank you for taking him into your presence. Taking his pain away taking his sorrow away. Yes, she was grieving. She lost the love of her life. But she was rejoicing for she knew, Tom, I won't see you here, but I will see you there. Amen? Amen. Amen. Yes. Oh, grave. Oh, death, where is thy sting? Oh, grave, where is thy victory? Amen? With this hope that God will prepare us a body to stand in His presence and defeat death and the grave, we should be steadfast, immovable in our faith. For we know that we will be rewarded for our labors. So let us begin to say with Paul, Death is swallowed up in victory. O oh, death, where is thy sting? O oh, grave, where is thy The devil can't keep. He wished he could. Life and death is in the hands of Almighty God. And none of us are going until He's ready for us. Amen. I mean, I'm talking about a child God. I'm not talking about somebody that's contemplating suicide or something like that. I'm talking about a child God who loves God. God will let us fulfill our purpose. And in many cases, sometimes it lets us fulfill a second purpose. And sometimes a third purpose. Amen. So don't be afraid. 
Amen. You start feeling those pains in your body, go see a doctor. Amen. But know that God is right there with you where you're at. I remember speaking to a senior citizens club one time. And I was on nitroglycerin. And I did a foolish thing, but anyway. I told the people I didn't think God wanted me to live the rest of my life with nitroglycerin. And I took my pills and I threw them in the garbage can and walked out. Not wise. Not wise. I got in my car and I was hit with the hardest pain in my chest. And I didn't have a cell phone in this door. You know? There was nobody to call me. And when those things hit you as hard as they do, you don't have much breath to call anybody anywhere except Jesus. <laughs> and I called on the name of Jesus. Satan sitting on this shoulder saying, See, I'm going to make a fool out of you. You're going to die right here. <laughs> and I could just get Jesus out. And then I got Jesus help me out. <laughs> And I want to tell you, the more I called on the name of Jesus, the less the pain was. Amen. And by the grace of God, God got me through that. My stupidity got me through that. 